So moving on to thermoregulation of the newborn, really um, pneumo, newborns have been in a nice, warm, comfy, cozy environment and they really need to maintain their temperature within a very narrow range. So what we would like to see is our newborns maintaining normal thermic temperatures and that's going to require that we create a normal thermic environment for them. So once they are delivered, oftentimes what you will see is um, we put baby skin to skin. We can also use the radiant warmers, just making sure that we warm, dry, stimulate. Once um, they've dried the baby, changing out those blankets so that the baby's not lying on wet blankets. So lots of different ways to protect that baby. And like I said, we don't want to get these newborns cold stress because that will cause uh, decreased reactivity and could also uh, end up in some type of brain um, damage. So with modes of heat loss, the four types of heat loss are listed out up here, convection, radiation, evaporation, and conduction. So when you're thinking about conduction or convection, let's start at the top. So thinking about convection, we want to swaddle them and we want to increase the nursery temperature so that that outside air is um, warm and they're not losing heat that way with radiation, um, keeping them away from drafts, making sure that the surfaces are warmed, objects aren't cold. Um, evaporation is warm and drying, so we want to make sure that once the baby is born, we get their skin dry, or once you've given a bath, get them dry. Their head is going to be the biggest area for heat loss, so putting the hats on them, once you've washed their heads, making sure that you get that cap back on and getting their hair dry. And then conduction is loss of heat to cooler surface, so we want to pre-warm surfaces, cover surfaces with pillow um, cases, those kinds of things. So when we see heat loss, um, when the infant is trying to conserve the heat, what they can do is get into a more flex position, when they're trying to raise their temperatures, what we see is an increased metabolic rate and especially of the vital organs. They do have non-shivering thermogenesis, which is unique only to the newborn. But with the non-shivering thermog thermogenesis, they use up their brown fat stores. And remember from talking in class earlier that these brown fat stores aren't laid down until that last trimester. So if you have a preemie, they don't have those stores. And those reserves can be rapidly depleted. So it's the best idea to keep them warm. When you touch the newborn, what you will feel is that they will feel cool and then you may have some increased acrocyanosis so we would like that not to occur so problems with cold stressing for the newborns it causes an increased need for oxygen and glucose so the infant will initially start by increasing their respiratory rate they it could lead into respiratory distress and that would lead to uh, respiratory acidosis with the body using oxygen for thermogenesis, you know, it's one way that the infant survives. It's their survival mode. So oxygen is going to be diverted away from the brain and the vital organs to help raise that body temperature. And in doing that, that's the, the reason why respiratory distress can happen and acidosis can occur. With hypoglycemia, it takes three to four times more glucose to elevate that body temperature. And so that's where we're going to look at metabolic demands. So truly, they, they could go into metabolic as well as respiratory acidosis. Um, and so really what we want to do, the only thing I can say about the cold stress is keep these newborn babies warm. Listed out on this slide are several risk factors for hypoglycemia. So we need to think about um, doing blood glucose checks on our newborns. Refer to hospital policies because not all hospitals are the same. I do know that there is a statewide initiation from the Perinatal Association of Iowa that suggests we do check a blood glucose on every infant, but sometimes hospitals are not doing that if they don't fall into one of these risk categories. So just kind of go off what your hospital policy says. But what we would like to see is a blood glucose at least 45, if not 50. 50 is going to be really where we'd like to see that. So signs of hypoglycemia, poor muscle tone, sweating, tachypnea, dyspnea, cyanosis, 
Um, there's several listed out up here. Um, seizures and coma. We, you know, I've seen where a blood glucose has been extremely low and the infant is lethargic, not really very responsive. Uh, so checking blood sugars, ensuring that we're taking those babies out to breastfeed, offering the bottle if they're bottle fed, and just trying to get a little bit of glucose in them to maintain that blood glucose greater than 50. Hepatic adaptations. Uh, the one thing to mention about the iron storage is that newborns do store enough iron to last them through about the fifth month of life. So it's not always necessary for those newborns to go home on an iron supplemented formula. Um, breastfed infants, you know, we've talked that breastfed, breastfeeding is, you know, natural and it's that 100% compatible with the newborn. Um, so what we see with that though is that we do, there is an increased risk for bilirubin and that bilirubin conjugation is caused from the breakdown of red blood cells. And really the, the way the newborn is going to excrete that is via the stools. So those meconium stools and the meconium changing to transitional stools and normal stooling pattern, that's what we'd like to see as far as decreasing the effects of or the, the risk of jaundice. We'll talk a little bit more about bilirubin. As I said before, bilirubin is the product of a breakdown of red blood cells. Um, so when red, red blood cells reach the end of the lifespan, their membranes rupture and hemoglobin is released. So when that hemoglobin is released, uh, macrophage, macrophages phagocytize it and split it into heme and globin. And then that heme is broken down and converted to con unconjugated bilirubin. Uh, which must be conjugated for excretion. So we see the infant excreting that urobilinogen in the stools as well as in the urine. And if we have an infant that's not feeding well and not um, urinating and defecating, we can see an increased risk uh, for jaundice of that newborn. So when we think about the clotting factors, it's important to remember that the clotting factors are synthesized in the liver and they do require vitamin K in order to become activated. So since the newborn's gut is virtually sterile at time of delivery, um, the newborn needs that injection of vitamin K um, in order to help the um, gut bacteria to synthesize additional vitamin K. So when we think about those types of things, um, it's really important for the, the newborn to get that vitamin K and help the liver in developing clotting factors. With GI adaptation, this talks about your full-term infant. And so we do see full-term newborns having an increased amount of mucus or um, oral drainage due to having the amniotic fluid in the lungs. You see it especially in the C-section babies that don't have that vaginal squeeze. So make sure that you always keep a bulb, a bulb syringe available um, and watch those newborns for aspiration. Their GI adaptations actually with increasing gestational age, they do t tend to definitely do better. Um, sucking occurs much easier and much more readily in the full-term newborns compared to the preemies because the, that sucking coordination isn't always there. So it sometimes can be very uncoordinated. Um, they do have an increased incidence of regurgitation or spitting up. So sometimes you will see in the nurseries that they do keep the head of the, the bed, the head of the bed or the head of the crib elevated. With weight loss and weight gain patterns, it's going to be really normal for us to see a 5% 5 to 10% 5 to weight loss during uh, hospitalization or during that birth period. Um, but what we would like to see is when we do those follow-up visits that they have 
attained their birth weight by about the 10th day of life. So the, the feeding patterns, those types of things, um, and weight gain, that's how we're going to ensure that they are getting adequate nutrition. So educating about wet and dirty diapers and how many of those the, the baby should be having each day. Um, those first stools are called meconium, and we've talked about that. What we like to see about the day of discharge is that the baby is having some transitional stools, which are kind of golden and seedy. And um, if a baby doesn't have meconium within the, you know, after 24 to 36 hours, that's when we're going to kind of be worrying about them a little bit. Um, breastfed babies typically have a very soft, loose, golden, yellowish stool, and they can have as, as, as many as 10 stools per day, or they may not have any for a couple of days because of um, how breastfed, breast milk is digested and um, used by their little bodies. When we're talking about renal adaptations, the kidneys start producing urine around 12 weeks. And then we, we talked about when we were talking about um, pregnancy, that, that is, the, the kidneys begin to work and the, the baby swallows that amniotic fluid and voids and swallows and voids. Um, so at term, that normal newborn isn't able to concentrate their urine. So they are at a higher risk for dehydration or hypo, uh, hypervolemia. So we do need to watch what their voiding pattern is and we should see them voiding within the first 24 hours of life. We do see some newborns having a pseudo menstruation, which is just, you might see some pink tinge in their diaper. Um, and that's going to be really normal. It's just from the adjusting to the loss of mom's hormones. So I and O in the in the newborn, the first couple of days they're listed out up here as well as after those first two days, infant or intake is really going to be dependent on the infant size, on their hunger level, on their level of alertness, on their gestation. So lots of different things going on, but really the best way to tell is by getting weights and then doing um, diaper counts and things like that. With the immunologic adaptations, we talked in basic concepts that um, infants are at an increased risk for infection, especially within those first few months of life. So it's important for us to tell uh, mom and dad and provide education on good hand washing, keeping those infants away from lots of people. Um, signs and symptoms of inf infection that we do need to also educate on are temperature instability. So when you think about the adult, you know that adults typically get a, an elevated temperature when they have a bacterial or viral infection or our, our temperature goes up it's can go up or can go down in the newborn just because they don't have that mature thermo uh, regulation so watching for temperature instability when we're talking about an elevated temperature in a baby however though elevation is greater than 100.4 we don't wait until they get to 101.4 um, we will see some lethargy decreased feeding abilities and those types of things just to touch a little bit about NRP, which is something that you'll be exposed to if you should, should decide to go into labor and delivery. And this just talks, this slide talks really about neonatal resuscitation and what you will see occurring. So when we're looking at this, this algorithm gives you nice information. Um, if there, It talks about where the fetal heart rate is, what the tone is, what the respirations are, when you should perform CPR, when you should do chest compressions, when you should uh, offer just rescue breathing or positive pressure ventilations. And we'll talk a little more about that and kind of elaborate on that in class. As far as the nursing interventions immediately in the delivery room, um, there is a video that we will, wa we will watch in class, but these are essentially all of our interventions that we need to be doing when that infant is born. So warming, drying, ensuring um, cardiopulmonary functions, so ensuring that they're breathing. And when we're talking about breathing, they need to have a respiratory rate of greater than 20. If we're thinking of uh, their cardiac, we want to see a heart rate of at least 60 and rising, if not some tachycardia. Um, we're going to assign some APGARs, and we'll talk about APGARs at 1 and 5 minutes. And if it's still less than 6 at 5 minutes, we need to do it again at 10. Getting that weight recorded, the measurements, getting eye ointment, vitamin K, 
um, monitoring those vital signs and then getting those ID bands on the newborn will be um, really our basic focus. We will watch a video over gestational age assessment and discuss more of this in class. So just come prepared with some questions uh, that you may have and we'll discuss those further in class.